Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the last lecture, we looked at the most important notion of vector spaces. Vector spaces are like the universe in which we carry out linear algebraic calculations. We found that the vector space is made up of two basic operations on a non empty set V and a field F. The two basic operations are addition and scalar multiplication. We had the various laws connected with addition and scalar multiplication. Then we looked at a number of examples of vector spaces among them were this standard models and examples of f k the collection of k by 1 vectors over a field f. In particular if we take f equal to r we get the real vectors and if we take f equal to the complex number field we get the c k. Then we had the model of the m by n matrices f m cross n and in particular if we take the field to be the real field we get the collection of all m by n matrices with real matrices which form a vector space and analogously if we take f equal to c we get the vector space of complex matrices. In particular, if we take f equal m equal to n, we get the vector space of all square matrices of size n by n. Similarly, when we take f equal to r, we get the collection of all uh, real square matrices. When we get f equal to c, we get the collection of all complex square matrices. The next collection of examples we saw were functions. So, we looked at a set S and we looked at a field F and we looked at all functions from S to F and we have the standard point wise addition and point wise scalar multiplication as the operations and this was a vector space over F. In particular, if we take F equal to R, we get the collection of all real valued functions on S which forms a vector space over R and if we take the f equal to C we get the collection of all complex valued functions over S and this forms a vector space over the field C. In particular if we take S to be an interval in R then we looked at two special types of functions one was L 1 i r which was the collection of all functions which belong to the collection of all functions from i to r such that their integral over i of mod f t d t is well defined and is finite. And similarly, we look at L 2 i r of all functions f from the interval i to c such that the integral mod f t squared d t is finite. Uh, we should read uh, r, we are looking at real valued functions. Similarly, 
in place of r if we take c we get complex valued functions in l1 complex valued functions forming l2. We shall now look at more examples of uh, functions and their vector spaces. Again we look at the collection of all functions which are defined on an interval and which take real values and the C stands for continuous. So, it is all those functions which are in the collection of functions from i to r such that f is continuous at every point in i. Now, with the usual addition loss for functions and scalar multiplication loss for functions, this is a vector space over r. Similarly, if we take the collection of all complex valued functions, they are functions from i, but they take complex values and f is continuous in i. Then this forms a vector space over f c. We shall look at one or two more examples which are uh, useful uh, in analysis. Let us look at the next example which we denote by f a lambda. This is the collection of all algebraic expressions of the form a naught plus a 1 lambda plus a k lambda k and as we vary these coefficients over f and vary k over all non-negative integers. So, collection of all these expressions which we get by varying the a naught a 1 a 2 a k s over f and varying k over the non-negative integers. Such expressions are called polynomials in lambda and we add the polynomials as normal functions are added and we multiply a polynomial by a scalar as normal functions are multiplied by a scalar. Then this f of lambda the collection of all polynomials forms a vector space over f and the 0 vector in this vector space is the 0 polynomial. And if we have a polynomial just like in functions, if we have a polynomial a naught plus a 1 lambda plus a k lambda power k, p is in f lambda, then the minus p is the polynomial defined as usual which is minus a naught plus minus a 1 into lambda plus etcetera minus a k into lambda to the power k. In particular if we take f equal to r we get r lambda polynomials with the vector space of polynomials in lambda with real coefficients and this is a vector space over r. The scalars have to be taken as r and if we take f equal to c these are two important uh, fields which we will always be looking at then we get c lambda the vector space of polynomials over c. When we say polynomials over c, we mean the coefficients are c and this is a vector space over c. The next example is a special version of polynomials. So, let d be any positive integer 
for example, we can take d equal to 4 or 5 or whatever positive integer we need. So, let d be a positive integer and let f d denote polynomials first. So, they are all in f lambda, but they are special polynomials their degree of the polynomial p lambda must be less than or equal to d. So, you take the collection of all polynomials of degree below a certain threshold level say d. Then this collection of all such polynomials form a vector space with the usual loss of addition and scalar multiplication over f. Again we repeat if we take f equal to r we get the polynomials we will call simply I will call it real polynomials degree less than or equal to d and we get c d if we take f equal to c the polynomials with complex coefficients will simply write complex polynomials with degree less than or equal to d. We shall conclude our discussions of these examples with one more important example. We will be coming across many more examples little later. We will take one example from complex analysis and one example from Fourier transforms. Now, let u be the unit disk in the complex plane. What do we mean by the unit disk? U is the collection of all the complex numbers z such that mod z is less than 1. So, these are all complex numbers which means you just take the unit circle in the complex plane and look at the interior that is our unit disk. Take the circle of unit radius about the origin and look at the interior of that circle and that is called the unit disk. Then by h u we shall look at all functions which are from u to c. These are functions from u to c, but we are not going to look at all functions from u to c. We are going to only look at functions from u to c such that f is analytic in u or holomorphic in u, f is analytic in u. Then since these are functions we know how to add functions, we know how to multiply scalar uh, and a function and with this loss h of u the sum of two analytic functions is an analytic function. If you multiply an analytic function by a complex constant the result is again an analytic function. So, h u is a vector space over c. Now, we can replace u by some domain d in the complex plane c and then we get h d the collection of all analytic functions which are functions from d to c such that f is analytic in d. These vector spaces are very useful in complex analysis. One final example as we said on Fourier transforms. Let us look at L 2 R C. What do we mean? Recall this means we are looking at all functions from R to C. That means they are defined for all values of the real number t. So, f of t we have a function of t where t can vary from minus infinity to infinity over the real numbers and the f of t the value of the function at the point t is a complex number. So, it is complex valued function of a real variable and we are not going to look at all such functions. This L 2 stands for those functions for which 
if I take the mod f t square d t that is integrable one has to be technical here technically it has to be Lebesgue integrable and that mod f t square which is Lebesgue integrable the integral is well defined and the integral is less than infinity this we will call as L 2 R C. Now, look at all these functions for any f in L 2 R C the Fourier transform actually it should be called the Fourier Plancherel transform. is defined as we denote the Fourier Plancherel transform by f hat it is a function of omega defined as integral over r which is integral between minus infinity to infinity f of t e to the minus i omega t dt. Now, technically again we will not get into the details of the definition of the Fourier Plancherel transform. The integral has to be interpreted as a integral as a limit in the mean. Now, once we have this Fourier transform well defined, we look at a positive number omega. So, let omega be a positive uh, real number and look at b sub omega which is all those functions in L 2 R C. So, we are looking at not all the functions in L 2 R C, we are looking at all those functions in L 2 R C for which the Fourier transform is 0 for mod omega greater than or equal to omega here omega is again a real number this function we take it as defined for all omega belonging to r. So, we are looking at all those functions in L 2 r for which the Fourier transform is 0 beyond a certain stage we say that the Fourier transform has support in the interval minus omega omega that is f has f hat has support in the interval minus omega omega outside this it is 0. Such functions are called ba band limited functions in the context of signal processing these are called band limited signals with omega as the bandwidth. So, these are band limited signals or band limited functions with bandwidth omega. And since these are functions we know how to add functions we know how to multiply a function by a scalar and we see that these form a vector space B omega is a vector space over C. This class of functions band limited functions come in handy in signal processing and in Shannon's sampling theorem. Now, we have seen a number of examples of vector spaces we shall be looking at more examples as we go on, but for the moment we shall have these examples in our bank and try to use them whenever we need. We now introduce another important concept in fact the first important concept in vector spaces known as linear combination. What do we mean by linear combination? Let us consider a field f, f is any field 
and V is a vector space over F. So, we have vector space over F. Let us look at a vector x in V. So, x is a vector in V. So, we have a vector in a vector a fixed vector x in the vector space V and now we see what are all the vectors what are all the vectors that we can build that we can build starting from x. Now, this question has to be explained further what do we mean by build you have to start from x do something to it and then produce another vector that is a vector which we say is built from x. Now, what can I do to x the only two things that I know to do in a vector space are addition and scalar multiplication. So, build really means using the two operations in the vector space namely addition and scalar multiplication. So, start with a vector x in V and see what are all the things that you can build using that x and the things that you are allowed to build are the only thing that you can do in that universe in that universe of that vector space the only things that we know to do are the addition and the scalar multiple these are the algebraic things that we have introduced and these are the only things that we can do. So, now let us look at addition what can we do starting from x we know only x we can use only x. So, we can use x any number of times so you can use a x and x so I will get 2 x. So, 2 x is a vector which I can build using x. Now, I can add x to 2 x and I will I denote this by 3 x and so I can build 3 x. Continuing this way I will say for any positive integer n we can build n x starting from x. So, that is the first building process we shall now look at <coughs> what we can do using scalar multiplication. Now, you see we already have one type of scalar multiplication generated by addition namely n x. Now, instead of n scalar multiplication says you could have chosen any alpha in the field. So, let us look at <coughs> alpha in f then we can <coughs> build alpha x as x as alpha varies over f we get a large collection of vectors and we see that this encompasses the n x which we have got already. So, addition can also be subsumed in this <coughs> scalar multiplication. So, the conclusion is the vectors that we can build starting from x again using only the vector space operations of addition and scalar multiplication are precisely the scalar multiples. In fact, all the scalar multiples alpha x alpha belong to of x. So, starting from an x 
all that we can build or the scalar multiples of x. So, that is one step where we start from a small thing and try to build as much information as possible. Then at a next level let us start with two vectors x and y in v. Now, what are all the vectors? that we can build using x and y. Once again I repeat when I say build the only two operation the only thing that you can do with these vectors are either add or do scalar multiplication. Now, let us look at the answer to this question starting from x we have already seen that we can build alpha x, where alpha varies over f. Yeah. Similarly, starting from y, we can build say not alpha x, we use some other notation beta y, where beta can vary now, once we have these alpha x and the beta y's, we can add them and then from this we can build alpha x plus beta y where alpha and beta belong to f. So, thus we see starting from two vectors x and y. So, the conclusion is that starting from x and y in V starting with two vectors x and y in V, we can build all vectors of the form alpha x plus beta y, where alpha belongs to f, beta belongs to f. Now, we extend this idea we see that if we have in general instead of 1 or 2, if we have a finite number of vectors. So, let s be u 1, u 2, u r be a finite set of vectors. in the vector space v. Then what are all the vectors that we can build using u 1, u 2, u r? Obviously, you can build alpha 1, u 1 from u 1, alpha 2, u 2 from u 2. So, u 1 builds alpha 1, u 1, u 2 builds alpha 2, u 2 and so on, u r builds alpha r, u r. So, now these together build alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha 2 u 2 plus alpha r u r. So, the collection of all the vectors that we can build starting from u 1 u 2 u r, the vectors that we can build using the vector space operations are precisely those vectors which are of the form alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha 2 u 2 plus alpha r u r. So, starting the conclusion of all our discussion so far is that starting from a finite set of vectors s equal to u 1 u 2 u r where r is of course a positive integer, the set of all vectors that we can build using the vectors in S or we will call them S vectors 
posing the vectors in S are precisely those vectors which are of the form alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha 2 u 2 plus etcetera alpha r u r where the alpha j's are all in f. So, we have a large collection of vectors which we can build starting from these s vectors. Now, we give a name for all these vectors or the type of vectors that we can build from u 1 and that is what is known as the linear combination of the vectors. So, we have a definition let s equal to u 1 u 2 u r be a finite set of vectors in B. Of course, we now have our always a universe as V vector space over a field F. This will be our universe. All the work will be done in a vector space V over a field F. So, let us take a finite set of vectors u 1, u 2, u r in a vector space V. Any vector of the form any vector of the form alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha 2 u 2 plus etcetera alpha r u r where alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha r belong to f is called a linear combination it is actually in engineering terms it is a superposition of the s vectors a linear combination of the vectors in s. From now on for linear combination we will just write L c as the short form. Now, let us look at some simple examples. Let us take the first example, let us take the vector space V to be R 3 and let us take S to be a finite set say just two vectors where u 1 is the vector 1 minus 1 2 and u 2 is the vector 1 0 1. Now, let us look at the vector u equal to 1 minus 2 3 u is a linear combination of vectors in S. We claim this. In order to claim this, we must show that u can be written as a linear combination of u 1 and u 2, which means we must find scalars alpha 1 and alpha 2 such that u can be written as alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha 2 u 2. So, we will simply say it is easy to say not very difficult to check that u is equal to 2 times u 1 plus minus 1 times u 2. We see for example, 2 times u 1 2 times u 1 plus minus 1 times u 2 gives us 2 minus 1 which is 1 minus 2 0 which is minus 2 and 2 into 2 is 4 minus 1 is 3. So, therefore, it is easy to see that u is equal to 2 u 1 plus minus 1. So, in this case alpha 1 is 2 and alpha 2 is minus 1 and both are in R. See remember our vector space is R 3 and we must find the scalars in the vector in the field f that is R and that is what we have found. We have found alpha 1 and alpha 2 both real 
numbers. So, that is our first example. Let us look at our next example. Let us take the vector space to be the complex vector space now C 3 and obviously, of course, our field is in this case is C. So, we are look at C 3 as a vector space over C and now again we look at a set S which consists of just say finite set. So, let us start again look at two vectors u 1 and u 2 where u 1 is 1 0 i. Now, the components can be the entry can be complex because we are working over a complex vector space and u 2 is 0 i 1. So, we have a finite set of vectors u 1 and u 2 where u 1 and u 2 are as defined. Now, look at the vector u which is 0 i i. This again a vector in C 3 because we are allowed to have complex vectors. We claim u is a linear combination of vectors in S. For this we have to find two scalars alpha 1 and alpha 2. Now, the scalars are allowed to be complex numbers. So, we have to find two complex numbers alpha 1 and alpha 2 such that alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha 2 u 2 is equal to u. Again it is easy to check that I am sorry uh, let me slight uh, make a slight correction here uh, this should be i and this should be 0 it is much easier the calculations become easier. So, we have u is equal to i into u 1 plus u 2 or 1 into u 2 to be more precise i into u 1 plus 1 into u 2. Let us check this i into u 1 will give you i plus 0. So, that is i i into u 2 will give 0 here 1 into u 2 will give i. So, that is this i i into u 1 will give minus 1 here and if we add u 2 minus 1 plus 1 will give you this 0. So, u is equal to i u 1 plus i u 2. So, alpha 1 in this case is i alpha 2 is 1 both are in C therefore, u is a linear combination of vectors in S. Let us look at another example. Let us take the vector space V to be the vector space of all 2 by 3 matrices. Again we look at a finite set of vectors to make things easy simple. Let us look at two vectors. Now, vectors are all matrices. Let us look at two vectors in this where A 1 is the matrix 1 minus 1 1 0 1 1 and A 2 is the matrix 1 1 1 0 1 0. Then the matrix A which is a vector in V which is 1 minus 3 1 0 1 2 is a linear combination of vectors in S since again it is easy to check that A is equal to 2 times A 1 plus minus 1 times so, in this case alpha 1 is 2, alpha 2 is minus 1 and therefore, we have expressed A as a linear combination of the vectors in S. One final example, let us 
let us look at the vector space V to be the vector space of polynomials in the variable lambda. Let us look at a finite set we should have vectors in V but vectors in V are polynomials. So, we will say P1, P2, P3 let us take a finite set of 3 vectors that is 3 polynomials where P1 is the polynomial P1 lambda equal to 1 plus lambda, P2 is the polynomial P2 lambda equal to 1 minus lambda, P3 is the polynomial P3 lambda equal to 3 plus lambda. Now, let us look at P lambda which is 2 plus 4 lambda. This is again a polynomial, its coefficients are in R. So, therefore, this is a polynomial. So, let us take f to be R to be much simpler. So, we have a polynomial over the reals, we have 3 polynomials, we are now looking at a fourth polynomial 2 plus 4 lambda and P lambda is a linear combination of vectors in S that is those polynomials in S since again it is easy to check that P lambda is 3 P 1 plus minus 1 into P 2 plus P 3 again see for example 3, 3 P 1 will give me 3 into 1 plus that is 3 minus P 1 will give me minus 1. So, 3 minus 1 will give me the 2 this 0 is not uh, the I am sorry this is 0 times P 3 this should be 0 times P 3. So, this is not contributing anything then look at uh, the lambda terms 3 P 1 gives me 3 lambda and minus 1 P 2 gives me another minus of minus lambda plus lambda. So, that gives me the 4 lambda and the third term has no contribution. So, in this case we have alpha 1 is 3 alpha 2 as minus 1 alpha 3 as 0. So, thus we have P lambda is a linear combination of the vectors in S. Note we can also write P lambda the above P lambda namely this polynomial 2 plus 4 lambda as P 1 lambda plus minus 2 times p 2 lambda plus 1 times p 3 lambda. Therefore, we see that the same polynomial p lambda is not only a linear combination of p 1, p 2, p 3 which can be written as this linear combination, it can also be written as this linear combination. So, we have now chosen beta 1 as 1 beta 2 as minus 2 beta 3 as 1. So, the same linear combination it may be possible to express as two different or more than one different ways as a linear combination of the vectors. Let us pursue this idea a little bit. To begin with let us start with a vector space again this is our universe v is a vector space over f. Now, let us start with a finite set of vectors u 1, u 2, u r and then look at linear combinations. What are linear combinations? These are vectors of this form alpha r u and where do I have to choose alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha r? I am allowed to choose alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha r in the field f. In particular, we can choose alpha 1 as 0, alpha 2 as 0 and so on alpha r as 0. Suppose I choose all the alphas to be 0, what do I get? I get the linear combination I we get the the linear combination 0 u 1 plus 0 u 2 plus 0 u r which is a vector theta v. 
thus we see that whatever set we start with whatever finite state u1 u2 ur we start with in v we can always get the zero vector as a linear combination of these vectors so we can build the zero vector from any finite set of vectors so and therefore the zero vector is not of much use in building processes because it can be any way obtained from other vectors now this particular linear combination that we have written in which all the coefficients alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha r are zero is called the trivial linear combination this linear combination is called the trivial linear combination that what is the trivial linear combination it is the linear combination in which all the coefficients are zero so therefore a linear combination is said to be non trivial linear combination if at least one of the coefficients is not zero so alpha 1 u1 plus alpha r u r is called a non trivial linear combination if at least one of the alpha j is not 0. So, now what we have observed is that given any any finite set S in V the trivial linear combination of vectors in S yields this the 0 vector theta v and therefore, we can always get the 0 vector in this form as a linear combination of any finite set of vectors. This raises the following question is the trivial linear combination the only linear combination that will yield the 0 vector is the trivial linear combination the only linear combination that will yield the 0 vector theta v. Let us look at one or two simple examples before we look at answer this question. Let us take v equal to r 3 the vector space r 3 over f. Let us take s to be u 1, u 2, u 3 a finite set of 3 vectors where u 1 is 1 1 0 u 2 is 1 0 minus 1 u 3 is 0 1 minus 1. So, we are set of 3 vectors in R 3. Now, we investigate the question is the trivial linear combination the only linear combination that yields theta v theta v in this case is theta 3 let us look at that let us look at any linear combination alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha 2 u 2 plus alpha 3 e 3 if it has to be our aim is to find a linear combination which gives the 0 vector. Suppose I have a linear combination which yields the 0 vector what does that say that says alpha 1 into 1 1 0 plus alpha 2 into 1 0 minus 1 plus alpha 3 into 0 1 minus 1 is 0 0 0 which implies alpha 1 plus alpha 2 comparing the first coefficients comparing the second coefficients we get alpha 1 plus alpha 3 equal to 0 
comparing the third coefficients on both sides we get r n s alpha 2 plus alpha 3 and the only thing that can satisfy all these three equations is alpha 1 equal to alpha 2 equal to alpha 3 equal to. So, the only linear combination of these three vectors that can yield the 0 vector is the trivial linear combination. Therefore, only trivial L c leads to theta v. Let us look at another example. Again let us take v equal to r 3 itself, but now let us take s to be u 1, u 2, u 3 again, but now let us take u 1 to be 1 0 1, well, let us say 1 1 0 like before and u 2 to be 1 0 minus 1 and u 3 to be 3 2 minus 1. Now, we observe 2 u 1 plus 1 u 2 plus minus 1 u 3. If you look at this 2 u 1, let us look at the first components 2 u 1 will give me 2 plus this 1 3 and this minus 3 that will be 0 and then second component 2 and minus 2 that will be 0 and similarly the third will be 0. So, this will be exactly the thing. Now, we have a linear combination in which the coefficients are not 0. So, alpha 1 is 2 not equal to 0, alpha 2 equal to 1 not equal to 0, alpha 3 equal to minus 1. So, we needed at least one coefficient not 0. In fact, we have got many coefficients not 0. So, this is a non trivial linear combination. yielding theta v. So, now we have two examples in one of which only trivial linear combination yields a 0 vector in another example in which non trivial linear combinations that yield the 0 vector. So, there are sets for which only trivial will give 0 vector and there are sets for which non trivial linear combinations will also give 0 vector we have to distinguish these two types of sets and therefore, we give the following definition. So, let S be a finite set of vectors in V. We say S is a linearly independent set of vectors linearly independent set from now on we will simply write L i for linearly independent set. So, from now on L i means linearly independent. So, we say S is a linearly independent set if the trivial linear combination is the only one that will give 0 vector. What does that mean? Alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha r u r where s is that set let us say s is the set u 1 u 2 u r. Then we say it is linearly independent only trivial must give 0 vector that means if it is equal to 0 vector this must imply all the coefficients must be equal to alpha nothing else can give us the 0 vector that is only trivial linear combination of vectors in S can yield the 0 vector. If the set S is not linearly independent, we say it is linearly dependent 
we write L D for linear dependent. We say it is linearly dependent. Notice linearly dependent means S is linearly dependent means that it is not linearly independent. Linearly independent means only trivial will give 0 vector, not linearly independent means non trivial will also give 0 vector means there exists alpha 1 alpha r at least one of which is not 0 such that alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha r u r equal to theta v. Now, this notion of linearly independent is a very important notion and linearly dependent is the negation of linear independence. The fact that it linearly independence in some sense means it the vectors contain non -redund, uh, redundant information whereas, when we say linear dependence means the vectors contain a lot of redundant information. Now, when we want to keep matter in a compact information in a compact manner, we would like to remove all redundancy. So, we would like to keep only linearly so independent information. So, this notion of linear independence is a very important information. We will look at some examples of linear independence and see how it helps in building up process in vector spaces. Thank you.